morning and namaskar everyone uh, this is the first of the kind of medical seminar we are having and uh, father's day seem to have come in the way but we when we thought about it a couple of months ago probably we missed that important event so otherwise we tend to struggle with crowds so many people come up hopefully they will turn up soon and uh, we'll give a bit of bit more encouragement to the speakers I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting, the Waju people of the Nunga Nation. Pay my respect to past and present. Uh, yeah, as uh, Kirti Daji, our coordinator for the day, mentioned, uh, there is a COVID vaccination clinic and uh, uh, there's a $20 voucher as well if you get your shot. Uh, that goes with that. That's organized by Divya Ji. So our wonderful team has been struggling and uh, not struggling, working very hardly uh, for the past four months. So this is one of it. We will have another medical seminar in the next, uh, before December. So with a great help from Dr. Gira, Dr. Mayank Bandari and the entire IMA team, it, it's, it's our, you know, uh, so so great to have this uh, entire medical fraternity helping us uh, with so many free, free information sessions. So I don't like to extend it very long. I'll leave it to the um, organizers to continue from here. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thanks for uh, coming and uh, happy Father's Day to all beautiful fathers here. Uh, I just got a call from my daughter to wish me happy Father's Day. So it's a great day for all of us. Uh, it's glad to be here. And uh, as probably all of you know, that we just formed a new executive team. Um, our outgoing president, Mank, is here. And a few members uh, are here, Dr. Lohit and Dr. Rekha and Ashwini. Uh, Ashwita is there. So uh, being uh, all from Indian, you know, we, we, we have grown up with the with a lot of good traditions uh, which we need to keep up in the Western world, um, whether they were a role of personality, lifestyle, dietary, and social habits uh, while we grow up, you know. And I have grown up in a small village in Punjab, and the diet was very healthy, and uh, thus we were already, uh, always outdoor playing, you know. We didn't have even TV. I, I don't remember having TV till I was 10 years old. And, uh, and, uh, the psychiatric disorders were there, so it's not that we have reinvented the wheel, but but the commonality was not that that much. Uh, and uh, as WHO says, uh, the health is not merely absence of disease uh, or infirmity, but it's a positive physical, mental, social, and spiritual health. And I think uh, uh, Indian continent was the one who emphasized the role of spiritual health before anybody else in the Western world even knew the term. And uh, as more, uh, all of us will know that Shishurta was a surgeon, you know, he was well before uh, the surgery was known in the Western world. And very interesting to know that he had not in contributed only in uh, surgery, but has elaborated certain parameters of health. So he said, Samsoda, which was equilibrium of body humors, uh, Smagi was a healthy digestion, and Smandhu was a normal body tissues and even coordination of body organs and mind and soul to maintain the homogeneity. So, so it is a long way that we have gone. Uh, and I think we need to work towards that and emphasize to our young generation who we are and, and stick to our roots. Uh, being a student of meditation myself, I can't stress more to dig in and get more helpful from mindfulness. But I'll get the, the eminent uh, psychiatrist leaders, uh, not only for this town, most of them sitting here are known nationally and internationally, and, and let them speak about uh, uh, all this. So I'll get Dr. Mank Bandari to come up and introduce the first speaker, please. Mank. Dr. Gera, for kind words. So as we start the proceedings of the day, um, we've got few speakers from our association, IMA, today. I'd first like to introduce Dr. Darshan Trivedi. Um, he's a leading psychiatrist uh, at Rockingham Hospital, uh, and he heads the old age psychiatry 
at Rockingham Hospital. His private practice is at uh, Hollywood Private Hospital. He's got special interests in various fields of psychiatry, uh, mainly psychiatric problems associated with neurological disorders. Um, apart from psychiatry, he's a very, very keen cricketer. He plays a lot of cricket. He represents our association uh, in cricket. So please welcome uh, Darshan Trivedi. He's going to talk to us on mental health issues in the age of age. Thank you, Darshan. All right. Uh, thank you, Manji, for the intro, and um, thank you, organizers, <clears throat> for this talk. I think uh, this is a much needed talk, and the reason I said this is much needed because mental health is one of the area I would say which is just as uncomfortable to talk about if you were not in this seminar. So if you were not feeling great emotionally, many people that are in the world who will find it extremely difficult simply because there are so many misconceptions or myths that are prevailing. And one such myth is any mental health problem is just a product of mind. If we talk about it, then we will be seen as a weak person or we are, it, it is seen very negatively. And if I'm very honest, even medical professionals are no better at expressing about their mental health because simply, we don't want to be seen as a weak person, while the fact is that all the mental health problems, they also have a significant base physically as well. The other reason is physical health problems are more measurable. For example, if you go to the GP and if your blood pressure is high, they will say, this, this is your blood pressure and hence you, you should take treatment. But because mental health is not as measurable concretely with the help of tests, we often consider it as insignificant. You will be surprised as the time passes, the prevalence of mental health is just growing significantly. I would say currently about one in every five to seven person will have some sort of emotional disturbance. And last year's statistics of Australian Institute of um, health and welfare suggests that 8.7 million Australians between the age of 16 and 85, which comprises the 47% of that group, had some form of mental illness. Why we talk about mental health in elderly? What is so special about it? As we all know that for children, there are dedicated specialists who understand their care very well, because their body operates differently and hence the treatment they need. Similarly with the elderly, their body is different. The way the changes are happening inside, it's different and hence the need for the treatment is quite different. Now, when do we call a person that he's old or elder? I mean, no one wants to grow old, isn't it? Given the choice, we will still stay in our 20s and 30s and will function just as great. But this term sometimes can be quite, I would say, um, difficult to accept. And it is not medically defined. It is rather more sociopolitically defined. The age where we think we are ready to retire, where our body starts to respond differently to the demands, both internally and how we deal with things from outside. And in, in different societies, it is, um, it is defined very differently. For example, in the Western society, the elderly means someone who is 65 years and older. I mean, as you all know, that the government decides that you can access your super after the age of 65. And, and that's where I think some of the line has been drawn. But it is hard to accept in certain way. Like in Indian context, if I talk specifically about the feeling old, I mean, psychologically, it can start anywhere from the age of 50. I don't know why. It is often culturally driven. And because in India, we have many states, and not from state to state, but even within the state, city to city, there is a different culture. 
they have different practices and you are given different roles. For example, if you move from city to the countryside or the rural areas, I think you are assigned certain responsibilities, even if you are 45 or 50, and you suddenly feel that I am an elder of the society. So it is not as simple to explain, but it, it can start anywhere from the age of 50. Now, so this is called the process of aging when we grow old. It doesn't start at set age. It is an ever evolving process. It is a very, very slow process. You cannot see from outside. So there are some finer changes, such as small scale changes that happen inside the body that we cannot measure. And hand in hand with those changes, it is also influenced by what is happening outside in our life. For example, stress and how we respond to certain demands. And you must be thinking, why I put these two photographs of um, Indian actress here? I mean, the top one, of course, you all know. She was quite prominent in Bollywood industry and hand in hand, she started her career in politics. And sometimes we feel, why? Sometimes we think simply about money that uh, maybe she was short of money that she needed to join politics and she knew that she wouldn't work anymore in Bollywood. No. The second point, if you see here, the retirement, it is often hard to digest. And I think the good thing about the Western society and specifically in Australia, that there is no set age of retirement it means you can work as long as you want to. And while you are working, it serves some purpose. You feel you are valued. You are achieving something. You are contributing something to the society. And as you all know, in India, if you were an employee, you have to retire at the age of 58 or 60, whatever is defined. And suddenly you feel, wow, what's next now in my life? And these are the factors which often add to the process of aging hand in hand with what's been happening inside the body. Like when I, when I talk about the changes inside the body, one such example is as we grow old, there are changes the way blood circulates in our system. The brain gets a little bit less supply. Then it starts to change the whole chemical level, the way it operates in the brain. And it leads to various sort of uh, conditions or emotional changes. And while the fact is that the mental health, it's not just about mind because brain is the control center for our emotions. And when we have certain changes in our body, brain starts to respond things differently. Also, I mean, if you look at the second gentleman, Mr. Devanand, he died at the age of 88. I think this photo of him is, I think, perhaps when he was in his late 70s or early 80s. And if you look at his dressing sense, in one interview, he said that age is just a number for me and I want to live it the fullest till the day that I, or day I die. So different people have different perspective towards life. And that also adds to how we feel emotionally. And sometimes on top of retirement, there are some happy milestones in our life. For example, even when we are working, when our children grow, when they finish university, or when they get married, suddenly we feel that, ah, I've become now father-in-law or mother-in-law. Now I have a special role to play. Or when there is a birth of grandkid, that also gives you kind of an extra status and you feel, ah, now I should behave in a certain way because um, I, I have certain responsibilities. So there are some happy milestones as well, which, which can add to that feeling old. On top of it, uh, certain health conditions or medical problems that we talk about, for example, any heart conditions, high blood pressure, cholesterol problems, diabetes, and, and so on. So there are two ways it can affect the aging process. Of course, emotionally, we start to feel that, look, now I'm getting all these conditions and psychologically it can affect, but also these conditions can affect the balance of certain neurochemicals in the brain, which are responsible for our emotional well-being. And, and, and these are the factors we need to be aware of. Similarly, social isolation. 
it is not just a physical isolation, but it could be emotional isolation as well. And, and the classic example is if, if your children are moving overseas and if you are in a place where you don't have great social networking, and most recently, I think in the last couple of years, we have seen the impact of COVID with the elderly people. They are the most vulnerable because they are worried about getting infected and have significant or catastrophic consequences. So these are the factors which can add to the process of aging. And the other thing is grief and loss. I mean, this is hard to put up with. Like when we are at certain age, we have certain friend circle groups. And when we see people dying, it understandably affects us emotionally. And even in the marriage, I think when one in spouse dies, it, it, it significantly affects your sense of aging. And, and that's why it is not just one simple thing, but it's an ever evolving process. And, and, and that's why elderly needs special care because as compared to the younger people, when they feel emotionally unwell, elderly will have a different symptoms, different cause and hence different symptoms. Now, what is normal and what is not normal? I mean, we all feel low from time to time, depending on what's been happening. We, we all feel worried from time to time. And it's okay to feel that way because that's how our brain controls the emotions. But when it is not normal, when you continue to feel down in the dump, more often than not, or when it lasts more than weeks or months, also when it starts to affect your ability to enjoy, it affects your relationships, you feel quite distressed and it doesn't help you to function the way you would normally function when you feel that I'm not worthy or sometimes you get very negative thoughts as the life is not worth living, it is seriously concerning and should be addressed. It is not always mind and the stress is not necessary to feel that way. Yes, stress can affect you emotionally, but to feel emotionally unwell, stress is not necessary. It could be anything else. And in elderly population, we also see some memory problems, which is a whole lot of different category, which needs to look at. And what, what shall we do when we have this kind of symptoms or problems? I think the best one can do is prevention, as we in our life know that it's best to prevent problems from coming. Similarly, in medicine, we said prevention is the best treatment. So to shape your life in a way where the aging gets delayed, or if it does come, you are not as susceptible to get problems. And hence, having an active, healthy lifestyle is very important. For example, regular exercise, which release certain neurochemicals, and, and that helps to feel well emotionally. Along with that, to make sure that you take your medications regularly if you have any health conditions, see your GP regularly, get your blood test checked, and also if you are smoking or drinking, make sure it's well under control because it can equally affect you emotionally. Maintain your social connections and do any work, any activity that you feel is maintaining your independence. And that's the most important part. But what if you still feel not great despite doing all these things? There are ways you can get help. Number one, speak to someone whom you trust. I know we are often worried that how that person will judge me. If you are not comfortable, go and see your GP. What your GP will do, GP will talk to you, take a detailed history to see whether there is anything physically wrong, whether there is any problem which needs to be addressed. They may do some blood tests, urine test, cardiogram, brain scan, whatever I mean is needed, depending on what you are experiencing. And if GP feels that you need to see someone more specialist, sometimes they can refer to a psychologist who helps you to kind of develop some coping strategies to deal with certain emotions. But if GP feels that 
you need more than that, they may refer you to psychiatrists who will then prescribe you some medication. Uh, and, and that medications can help to kind of improve your mood. So there are there are many ways one can get help. I'm not sure if 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 you know, but in Perth, we have a specialist older adult mental health service that caters for people over the age of 65 and it is fully government funded. It's a free service. So if your GP feels that you need someone like them, they can also refer you to the team. I mean, I know uh, we are running a little bit short of time, so I will, I will just end it here. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask me. If not, I will catch up with you um, after all the sessions are over. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the great talk. I think this is something that uh, being overseas and if we have family overseas, this is something that we all have struggled with during COVID. Uh, the fear of our uh, grandparents or other elderly in the family missing out or facing isolation. And you did mention some preventive um, measures to be taken. Is there anything specific that you would like to tell me as a, that I can look out for or I can do uh, for my grandparents back home and I think uh, it's, it's, it's a good question. And, and I think uh, it, it entirely depends on number one, I think what their core beliefs are, what they are more comfortable with. Because if you ask them to go and do some yoga, they said, no, I'm not going to do that. It's too hard. So I think the, the most important part is to find out what they are comfortable with. But the basic preventative strategies would be to make sure that diet is healthy. They are doing some exercise. And I'm, I presume that being at that age, they will be they will be spiritual people. Do you know to encourage them to maintain uh, spirituality and 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 connections they have in the community they are sort of living. That probably would be the most helpful. And I think the trickiest part is sometimes it's hard to get them to see doctor and main, make sure that they are taking their medications regularly. So if they have any health conditions, to make sure that they are compliant with them. That's the most important thing you can do. Yeah. Darshan, one more question. Um, fantastic talk, thank you. Um, just um, with mental health issues in elderly, what are your, what is your thought and opinion on, uh, do you see more uh, mental health issues in Indian community in Australia or overseas as compared to in India, because we are now away from our families, we are isolated, we are sort of uh, um, not in a joint family. So what are your thoughts? Uh, do we see more mental health issues in Indian community here? I think um, here, uh, the most of people that I see, they are generally young people. However, I would say that it's quite prevalent and significant in elderly as well. But unfortunately, because of certain cultural beliefs and certain hesitations, there is a bit of um, uh, resistance to come forward and ask for help. It is also about the acceptance of the problem because sometimes they feel uh, we, we should feel this because of our age and it's quite normal. So I think that also stops them from coming forward and ask for help. Thank Hello. You. Any other questions? Yes, there is one more question coming here. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I go. Yeah. Okay. Please. Uh, look, uh, this question is very similar to you asked. So the thing is, you said in here people feel elderly at the age of sixty-five, and in India about fifty. I think it is correct. So because we are half Indian, half Australian, we start feeling elderly. I think in between. <laughs> This is a fact. Now coming to the question, uh, most of us here are first generation Indians and many of us here are also passing through that phase. So what special conditions or special thought process we should adopt so that we don't fall victim to this mental issues and things like that and we continue to lead our life in joyfully, healthfully and you know, uh, contributing way to the society. Thank you. And I think um, it's, it's a good point, like specifically for first generation, I think, um, Australians, because when you come um, to Australia or anywhere overseas where you settle, 
your mindset is always that of back home and how you grew up there. And sometimes you find yourself misfit in the new place where you are sort of um, settling yourself. And when you try to fully kind of take over the new culture, it is not possible to integrate and emotionally fit in with that. So the best, I would say, strategy is to try and learn the, what's been happening in the society, in the new society or the culture, but at the same time, don't leave what you, you are already been or have already been practicing over the years and to have good social connections with the people of the same community who shares that value, that practice. And, and I think this is a quite a big area, to be honest, to talk about. But the most important part is to maintain the cultural practice and the connections is the key to make sure that you are not victim of, of those issues. Thank you. Just one last question. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is no black and white answer to that. If you go back to India, you'll be a misfit there also. <laughs> Sorry, due to time constraint, one last question. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Deepak. Uh, just adding to like what Sudhir has asked, and very similar, like as you mentioned, this mental health and well-being is more of associated with spiritual well-being as well, right? Mm -hmm. Though I'm a hard, strong believer and do practice. But I have come across many times when people feel like spirituality, when talking about mental well-being as a supporting factor, they relate with the religion. Hey, this is not my area, or this is not my, I don't feel comfortable. I mean, though it's spirituality is beyond religion, but how do you specify how do people make them disconnect? Hey, these are the two different aspects, because many people still have hesitation to adopt like yoga or breathing, meditation, because they say, no, it's, it's a different thing. So that I'm just trying to understand what would be your point to communicate how we can make people more convinced that nah, this is a really this is not religion or this is a spirituality, which is definitely for your health and well-being. And Thank I you. think the one way, I mean, um, one simple answer to that would be actually to increase the awareness to make sure that it is not related to religion only. So I think before you kind of get people to do certain practices, I think it's important to sort of get into their comfort zone and find out more, which I think it's difficult to do at the kind of mass level. So sometimes it needs more one-on-one -on -one approach to see what one's comfort zone is and, th and then to convince the person. So sometimes, and you're right, people often see spirituality as the religion. And, and I think that's where you lose half the people from coming. So I think it's more one-on-one -on -one work uh, will, will help. Okay, last one. Thank you, Darshan. That was a that was a very nice talk, and um, yes, gave us lots of pointers. Um, Darshan, my question is: my father is in India, and um, he has lot. So he's losing his sight, and he's he's losing his hearing. And what happens is my brother and my sister-in-law, they have to go outside to work. So he's getting more isolated at home. So it compounds it with the loss of sight and the loss of hearing. What can he do? And so he feels isolated, but I think it's also leading to some kind of, so he's not depressed. He's, all, he's always mm -hmm. been a happy person, but I think he's getting, it, it is bringing him down in a way. So what can he do? To, to maintain his well-being, mental well-being. Yeah. Um, is, it, is it okay if I catch up with you separately so we can just talk about it? Would be better, I think, if you're okay with that? Yeah. Thank you, Darshan. Good morning, everyone, and a very happy Father's Day to every amazing father here. I would like to invite Dr. Navni Johri. He's a consultant psychiatrist at Headspace Early Psychosis Team that covers the entire of the north of Perth and uh, for uh, people aged between 12 to 25 and with the first onset of psychosis. That's where his speciality is. He's originally from Gujarat and did his training at BJ Medical College, Ahmedabad. He worked as a psychiatrist in India before moving to Perth in 2006. For those who do not know already, 
He's a very keen badminton player and an unbeaten IMA champion and also a table tennis player. He is an amazing singer as well, for those who don't know. And how privileged are we to hear him talk to us about challenges and mental health issues faced by second generation migrants. Welcome, Dr. Namaskaram. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Rekha. Uh, how many people here understand Hindi? I'm saying that I'm going to open up all the secrets. Uh, look, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. Um, I think my talk will raise uh, possibly more interest in questions rather than answering some. It's a short talk. Um, um, Okay, so maybe let, I just thought we'll start with some uh, entertaining uh, pics. I'm sure most of us at least know what we connect. And uh, my deepest sympathies if we have been, if one of us has been subjected to this. Have we? I mean, can we, some of us raise hands? Has anybody been told? Okay. I hope, I hope and I wish that these things are not as relevant or not as prevalent, at least back home. But at least, you know, we are, we, we are this passing generation. We know this. We can connect to it. I doubt whether our kids can or will. Here is another one. Interestingly, somebody bothered. Interestingly, somebody bothered to do a study of of parents. How much do parents help their kids with their homework? And it was an international study with at least fifteen countries. So, guess who who tops the list? India. Well, it did. It does. So, India was on the top, and then closely followed by Vietnam. I think it said something like 12.5 hours average spent by an Indian parent per week to help the kids with their homework. And then Vietnam, and they are, they are uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries predominantly. I didn't see one Western world um, at all. Now, I don't know how scientific this study was, but I was just, it was just fascinating. Okay. Jokes apart, I guess this is probably to just probably lighten our moods, laugh a little bit, which is the medicine for a lot of issues that we all face with regards to mental health. Here is a bit of a serious one, but it's not. Let's, let's see how we go. So there is this heavy word called ethnocentrism. What it means in very simple terms is I am the best or my country or my culture or what I represent is the best and that's it. No second, no third to it. Now, you know, people like us, we fall into traps because we think, oh, we know, we know it all. You know, we, I know what ethnocentric is and I'm not ethnocentric. But it, it unfortunately doesn't work like that. You know, superficially we could say, okay, all right, we'll be good. You know, we'll respect and everything is good. But it comes to your son's, uh, I don't know, school, marriage, relationship, something else, and we are judgmental in a second. It just goes out of the window. So here, the point I'm trying to make here is that this is a universal thing. We are very, very likely to have this as a default position that what we have or the culture we represent or the times we represent are the best and everything else is second or sort of third. So I, I would like to keep it simple and, and I'm sure you will give me a feedback whether I was successful or not. But basically, there are two aspects to mental health issues for, uh, for children. So if you're like me, we are the first generation people who immigrated. And then we have second generation 
immigrants, which is our children, or you can say firstborn. So there are two aspects. So one is that one that affects everybody, the general stress and strain of migration. So there is a method of, you know, how stressors in life can be rated. What is the most stressful thing for most people globally? And then what can be the second and the third and the fourth? And there is a whole list. Now, migration is something that actually is on the top. It is very much one of the most stressful things people go through. And this is despite when it is very much chosen and you want to migrate and you have planned and you have, you have done everything. Because unfortunately, in the last 100 years on the globe, mass migrations have happened uh, across countries, but within countries. And a lot of them are forced. Forced migration is altogether a different ball game. Not really touching on, on that aspect. This is migration with choice. Now, the major issues that parents face while raising kids, I think is one is related to, you know, we very frequently talk about this word culture, culture. There are hundreds of definitions which may or may not agree I have kept it simple. This is my version. Culture is just a habit of doing things, a habit of thinking. It is passed down in generations. You can say it is acquired by the virtue of being raised in a family. Or if you like molecular genetics, you say this is all genetically mediated. Um, it's noteworthy that parents who have, you know, people have migrated, people like me, my identity is largely Indian first, and then I'm Australian. But for my kids, it's the other way around. They're Australian first, and they have Indian connection or Indian ethnicity. I think for children growing up here, the greatest struggle is to establish where are they in this transition. Indian, half Indian, three quarters Indian, you know, the whole, whole, whole gamut. This is particularly important for young people, young meaning uh, teenage kids, early 20s, where establishment of sense of identity is vital in any case. Suppose we never migrated, we were 2500 generation in the same geographical area. But the phase of life dictates that people have to form this sense of who they are and, and what they're good at, what they're going to be, and the whole sense of identity is anyway a challenge. And it, it takes a few years people, you know, before people get it right. For parents, there are, I think this is the problem that when I think of childhood, what is my default position? I'll go back to my memory lane and think of what happened to me. Sometimes consciously, sometimes it's just there. I'm not so there. So often our of our scale or balance, you know, how do we how do we reference uh, childhood? Goes back in time. It is a memory, and we believe it's the same. But a, a lot of times, I hope some of us agree. Mayank, I think, just said that you know there was a question that what I mean, can we go back? Is is that better? Is is it likely to give better health? Well, the trouble is we are likely to be misfit there. Why? Because things have changed. But in our memory, they're often stored. And you go back to the same school. I've been, I've been to my school, this school, that school. And yes, the building is the same, but the ethos, how, how and what happens has certainly moved on. And we have to understand it moves on everywhere. If you stay here, it's still moving on. You go back stay there five years and decide to come back. You're not coming back to the same place at the same time, even if the house is the same and the job is the same. The second aspect is that that affects only a small proportion of people. So I said migration affects everybody. My, my previous speaker, Darshan, who also happens to be a very fond friend, he mentioned, he was very conservative in saying the, the, the prevalence of perhaps one in six, one in seven, my version, a bit loose, I think everybody gets affected. Whether you call it a psychiatric disorder, yes, there, those definitions will push it to one in four. I mean, Australian uh, data also says one in four in lifetime will have some psychiatric illnesses. 
but I'm not talking definitions right now. I'm just talking about stress and strains and, you know, struggles. So the first part was everybody. The second part is only a very, very small proportion of people have specific problems. So lifetime prevalence of these following conditions, which include depression, specific phobia, anxiety, separation anxiety, PTSD, let's just say depression, anxiety, range of conditions is significantly higher in children who are born to first generation immigrants. This is very well known. So very, very quickly, I'm, I'm, as you will be very, I'll make it so obvious that I'm not talking about range of things, but I've just jumped on to what are we able to do? What can we do? So there are three aspects to it. How we conduct ourselves, what can we do within ourselves? What can we do to our children? And can children themselves do anything? Let's have a very quick look. Within ourselves, well, we are all very individually unique. Although most people acknowledge it cognitively, but often we find ourselves giving advices to others, oh, I did that. It may not work for the other one. May or may not work. So at the very least, I think that we have to be consciously aware that a lot of times our thinking is very rigid. Especially as parents, it gets rigid. Of, of hundreds of things, I'm highlighting only one. We have to acknowledge that it doesn't matter who we are, how capable we are, how good your genetics may or may not be, but we can have problems. It's a possibility. So these are general things which I am very sure many of you would know better than me, but I've just bothered to list them here. There are things if you do, you will stay grounded and the best you can be. So I think the principle is what can we do within ourselves? The principle is the best you can be. What can we do with our children? Well, first fact is, which is the purpose of this 10 minute talk, that an awareness that the children are exposed to more stressors than probably us and the next generation. So there is an acknowledgement that they're exposed to potentially greater stresses. Second, it's so obvious, but I have to say this because often when we deal with people one-on-one, -on -one, this is missing. Parents don't spend time and don't give attention and priority to children. This is globally there, but maybe more true of these times than two generations back, possibly, I don't know. Um, we need to develop mutual interest if and as much as it is possible. That's the only way your teenager kids are ever going to talk to you. Otherwise, their world changes. And that's not a problem. Um, we can't make them talk to us. But at least you try. You know, this. We are talking about what can you do. There are things you can do and things we can't. Take pride in our own roots as best as we can. I mean, you can't really pretend to take pride. And I'm incredibly proud. So if I'm proud, I don't have to try. It will ooze out of me here, there, and everywhere. Um, as we all know, the kids will copy us. So sometimes it can be a test. Sometimes it's a five, seven year, 10 year period of test where children will go off the tangent and you hope and wish and, and um, evidence says people come back. I think this is the most important and the, you know, there's a critical threshold. So there's something that everybody will be affected with, but when things start, truly start taking pair shape, then this becomes very important. If you identify issues, you cannot pass it on under the carpet. Sometimes shame becomes important. Sometimes embarrassment is important. Like my colleague said, and I think all of us who work in this area, we know it's very difficult to talk about emotions, emotional well-being or lack of it, or the fact that you have a problem and you're seeking help. So if you identify a problem, don't just wish that it will go away. Most of these problems don't go away so soon, so quick. 
You wish they do, but in case they don't, they are in your face. Uh, this has been mentioned, but I'll just still keep it brief. The entire healthcare setup, which if you're an immigrant, you will probably not know this. It's all a GP um, uh, network that, that determines health. So the, the health system works and thrives and uses the extensive range of GP services. Specialist services you cannot access directly. So your first point of contact has to be a GP. If you have a GP, uh, talk to them. If you know them for long, that's going to be even better. A mental health care plan is a well-known thing and so on and so forth. Can young people do anything? Well, largely no. Children can be very helpless just because of the, the whole process of from birth to, to a state of cognitive development where they are capable of, of, of talking about problems. But parental well-being, how what's the index of well-beingness of parents, mental health and issues like that, and emotional awareness. We're not all emo equally emotionally aware and we can't be, um, but that determines how much children are going to be affected and, and how well they're going to be looked after. The intention is rarely a problem. I mean, parents, the, better, the parental instinct is that it's never going to be an issue. So let's just summarize. I'm winding it up by saying that uh, growing up in a different country is a potentially very stressful phase. Um, but it's not, of course, all that doom and gloom. I mean, there are plenty of examples where everybody has done well. So it's not, it's not that everybody is going to be sick. I'm just saying that there is an in, increased sort of potential stresses there. The higher rate of mental health issues, or let's just say higher rates of psychiatric disorders are, are well known, but unfortunately the studies are very, very few in this area. Um, largely and loosely speaking, if, if we as parents are at ease, which means we are stable, and if I can just deviate a little bit using, uh, you know, the Hindi, Hindi slash Sanskrit word for health is swast. Do some of us know that, swast? So if you split the word swast into swa and, and sthit, swa means self, sthit means you're stable. So health is equal to stability in yourself. That is the literal Sandhi Vichyed, if you know, if you split the word into, in, into, into its more core components. So when parents are established in self, stable in self, at ease, you're not in this state of stress and something to do, you're always on, which could be great, you could achieve great, but it is at the cost of having peace. Um, look out for signs proactively. Troubles happen and do happen, and sometimes from the time they start, they can grow exponentially. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Namniji, for that amazing talk. Um, I don't know if many of you have faced this dilemma. For me, every time there's a cricket match between Australia and India, and I look at, of course, as Namniji said, I'm a very proud Indian. All my friends know that. But when I see my kids hooting for India, I'm like, is this the right thing to do? Have we done anything wrong? That's always there. So, but you have really reassured the fact that it's up to them, what they feel proud of, and it does ooze to them. So now we have five minutes of question time. And um, yes. Excellent talk, Lonnie. Um and I can totally, I'm sure many of us totally, totally can relate to these being first generation out here and having kids. Um, and I'd no shame in saying that I probably was very ethocentric to start with and all of us are accused of being so. Um, my question is, um, now my kids are teenagers now and I see themselves, they are so much aware of mental health from to start with because how they've been trained at the school and the colleagues and everything, which we never were, or we probably never are going to be in back home. Um, do you think they are better equipped or less equipped for coping 
because they already are aware of things from very beginning. And again, this whole second generation issue is very well known now to most of our kids even. You know, they will come and tell you, oh, you Indian parents, because I remember sitting outside the school and my kids coming to me and said, Daddy, I got 19 out of 20. And the first thing I will ask, Ek marka kya hua bhai? You know, we are all accused of that. Whereas the other kid is making a stick man and the parent will come and say, oh, my darling, it's gorgeous. It's awesome. You know, and we just are not like that. So do you think they are better equipped or less equipped because they are very well aware of this fact, especially when they grow up? It's a bit like this. Um, see, you know, when uh, in 16 onwards, you can start uh, driving lessons and you get a car license. So one is your cognitive awareness. Are you aware that you can have a lethal accident? So if you have no idea, you are probably more likely to have a problem. But do we think that because people know and they are aware, will it still avoid a lethal accident? Well, I think there is some scope. So, so awareness will add to help seeking, but does it really enhance coping? I don't think there is any correlation. Because if anything, this is my opinion, the most, most of what I said would be shared, and most psychiatrists and most colleagues will agree with that. This is my opinion that somehow we live in a relatively privileged society with access to so many things. Most of us, hopefully, and most of our children may not have seen adverse life situations. I think when that happens, our coping mechanisms actually reduce. It's a bit like a country which is always war prone is going to be ready for a next war, internal, external, even a virus threat if you've been exposed. But a place where you have had peace welding for quite some time, you probably your tools are getting, you know, they're rusted. They're not being used. So awareness is a definite step in, in uh, trying to achieve a state where people will seek help quickly. But I think that's not necessarily the same as enhanced coping. I think I personally think that coping has actually reduced. People who are who are being exposed to a lot of relative hardships. And I'm not actually saying we should expose them to that all the time or even as a intervention process, but it is a very well-known observation. This wisdom has existed in many other cultures. Thanks. Thank you to Dr. Trivedi and to you for uh, two wonderful talks. I've been an educator all my life since I turned 21. 17 of them spent, have been spent educating children in Australia. And among Indian migrant families, uh, instances of depression, anxiety, uh, alcohol and substance abuse that I now see, I mean, in homes where alcohol has never even uh, been served, I see those instances uh, rising. And in my observation, it's not a question, it's really as an educator, I just thought I'd bring this forth, that family unit, that is the bedrock of everything. And if we can provide our children not with more ch things, not with better homes and better cars and a Tesla and whatever, if we can provide them, and like you say, uh, resilience in children is lacking. They just can't face adversity. One take home message is the more you love your children, the less you will do for them. Let them find their way. We are just putting our thoughts on them, leading to really confused children on the verge of breakdown, mental breakdown. Uh, so let's provide that love and nurturing to our children within the homes. Stay connected with our extended families. And most of all, do less for our children children in terms of, you know, their homework and their assignments and driving them everywhere, let them find their way. Absolutely. I just want to add, and I'll take that opportunity to build up from what you have said, two things. One is when, you know, when you love your children, often for parents, <clears throat> fear is the core driver. So for some of us, we are more anxiety prone, some are less. But if your love gets mixed up with that core fear, 
you are likely to create more problems, although that was never your intention. Um, the second thing I want to very quickly talk about, I work in this area where we see young people with psychotic breakdowns. So, you know, your sanity is lost in, in simple terms. The prevalence and, and the prevalence of drug use is so worrying and so extensive. I'm, I'm yet to see a tsunami or a wave of, of, of young people of Indian origin yet. I do see here and there sometimes. But we need to be aware as this generation that the drug use is so rampant. I don't know how much you are exposed to in your day-to-day -day or life or even anecdotally. For me, this is five, six, seven reviews a day. The average age of starting use of cannabis has actually reduced in the last decade in Australia. It used to be 13, 14 or so, it's now 11. The range of illicit drugs that are available are completely mind blowing. I can't, people working in this area from first, you know, front line, I can't keep pace with what all is available. It is so extensive. It doesn't matter what, what school your kid attends. It doesn't matter what suburb you live. But if you want access, you'll get it. That is a deeply worrying uh, pattern that is happening. Young people otherwise should not have such high alarming rate of psychotic illnesses that we see. A lot of it is drug, drug induced, drug precipitated, meth, LSD, crystal meth. You, I, I can't go cope, cope with the, the, the range of. Uh, so, hopefully, I'll probably be able to execute it this some one day. But I would like a mass awareness program about it, especially with young people who have now improved and have recovered from psychosis. So, when your kid turns 10, 11, 12, before they hear that, oh, cannabis is cool, I want them to hear that if you, if you use it, you lose your mind. That message, so I think as Anand said, that awareness needs to happen. It would be a precursor. It may still not save you because it's a tsunami. We are having an absolute pandemic of drug use. Um, the third thing was that family unit, you said. I can't agree anymore. Family unit. If it is intact, reasonably intact, there would be stress and strains. No, there's nothing like an ideal parent or an ideal couple. But if you can hold on to the stress and strains that parenting can bring, that's the best chance you have, and the, that's the best chance your children have. A question can you time just one yes. thing. Time come. So, Dr. Sahab, you have opened the Dr. Rekha has opened it already. Which one? You are a pandemic and a champion, you are a pivot terrorist and a champion. So, you can show those skills, so at least you can show your skills. Anyway, so, Thank question. you. I'll just take it as a compliment. I think this is not okay, clear. Okay, thank you. Just a question. One thing I want to say is a very good session, very good information, and I really want to congratulate ISFA for organizing such beautiful speeches. And one uh, as aspect which I got from this, I didn't know that our children get more exposure to stress than ourselves, which was really awakening for me. And I will take it on board and and go from there. Yeah, yeah, because just very quickly. So stress is not just that you don't have a job and you are not uh, you're struggling to keep it there and you know making me ends meet. They they are very obvious, easy to spot stressors. But I think the stresses that probably I was uh, unconsciously um, pointing towards was, is this psychological framework? What am I going to be? It's a different how life at home and a different life at, uh, in the outside world, from food to, to dressing to true, festivals true, true, to Father's true. Day. I mean, to be honest, My I don't day. mind sharing this. Just Father's Day, anything, you know, does it mean much to me? No, it's just the school program I had to attend. Yes, I'm a proud father. For me, every day is Father's exactly. Day. But that's my personal it's thought. I don't want to share with it. Like, one thing I will request request this question. This question may not be true, truly relevant here. Now, what is our children are growing And they are coming into a marriageable age. So, apart from these stresses, there is another milestone coming is about their marriage. So, is marriage kewal Indian ko Indian community? Mein karni hai? Yeah, Indian stresses, stress boosters, so that we can, you know, prepare our children. So it would be really very useful for people like this. Thank you. 
just I, I'll answer that in a single go. It's none of our business. 13, 14, 15 onwards, 16 onwards, cognitive framework Agya hai. If they are growing up in Australian curriculum, their sense of autonomy is unbelievable, which probably you know if you have a kid. Uh, you just have to watch the show. <laughs> So, so nearby, wonderful question. Thank you, sir. Whichever way you marry, you are going to be on the closing side. Thank Just you. Uh, one last thing. Sorry, I won't take long time. Um, I agree with you. There was a paper last year, uh, resilience, and it was whether you uh, it's true or not, but there was one paper I saw that the resilience in refugee kids was more than the native children of Australia and New Zealand. Second question is these days, you know, uh, I'm a father of two children who are in uni now. I see a lot of uh, emphasis and these kids want to like discuss about uh, things in their friends and all with the psychologist rather than their own parents. So I think being Indian, uh, my, like, you know, you see these videos, Indian parents telling, you know, why you have to go to a psychologist, you know, discuss the things with me. And I think that's important. But what do you think about that approach which new generation is taking? And last question watch <clears throat> just enjoy the show look it's happening the autonomy is there we cannot do anything to it to be honest so this is very much a phenomena uh, which was already so i think it's actually a good sign of what is called as acculturation acculturation is that you culture or so there are phases i didn't go through it my many of them there are phases where how people settle Lekin wo rooting, if your roots have gone in, you are going to acquire what is very local. So this is an established norm in the Western thought that help seeking has to take this specific form. Uh, I guess traditional Indian societies may, this is not, this is still hard. Aap aaj ki tarik mein bhi kisi padhe likhe ko nahi bol sakta ke psychologist ko dekho. In, you know, people will not take it uh, readily. So that's, that's, look, we have to respect it. Let's all give a big round of applause to Dr. Nagbe. Thank you everyone for coming over on a Sunday. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sanjeev Sharma, who's a consultant psychiatrist with a varied interest, um, mainly around functional psychiatry, um, addiction medicine, and 360 degree care, incorporating evidence-based medicine and subject way of life. Mm -hmm. He has a special interest in non-pharmaceutical way, where it's possible and practical. He was born in Indore, trained in Punjab, and in the Man's Prestigious Institute in Bangalore, and been in Perth for 20 years, serving the community. Today, he is here with uh, Pooja, his lovely wife. Both of them are keen gardeners, and Pooja is a trained nutritionist and also trying to be a naturopath, and both of them are looking at holistic way of treating people both physical and mental well-being. Sanjeev, over to you. Thank you all to come here today. And I think my predecessors have already set the scene for today. So I don't have to talk much. But still, uh, there are a few things which I would like to do differently because uh, the way I practice my uh, specialty, which is putting a lot of lifestyle interventions in uh, mental health. And we all know that we are going through a difficult times and uh, what some of you asked about, how we can make a difference if we can make certain uh, prevention strategies to improve our lifestyle. So let's to begin with, let's look at the Australian Health Report Card. Because this is very, very important because we are now here and we have to seriously ponder upon that, is it something we are doing okay or we have to look something better? Guess what? We are all going to live reasonably well. Up to 18, women slightly better. I always like that Mother Nature is, has given privilege to a lot of females. Now, what I want to raise a question here, do you want to add years to life or life to years? Okay, I'll repeat again. Do you want to add years to life or life to years? Because you may still work in a band-aid manner, going from one problem to another, to another, another, one specialist to another, including myself, or you want to have 
certain positivity in your life. Unfortunately, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, uh, we are not eating uh, too many vegetables. We are not eating too many vegetables. About 92% of Australians do not eat five serves of veggie every day. And our kids are even worse. So first thing is, why is that? Because when we are eating a lot of healthy fibers in our diet, what happens is we feed those residents which are sitting in our large intestine. All of us are only 10% humans, all of us. The reason being, a substantial chunk of our weight is actually those bacteria which are living in us. When we eat nicely, we feed them when they are fed properly. Then as a result of that, our not only our physical health, but our also mental health is taken care of. We are one of the countries which has got too much of weight. Okay. And that is one of the leading cause of uh, problems in the world. Okay. I remember when Baba Ramdev came to Australia, I had a privilege to spend some time with him. He says, Aaj ki problem ye hai ki bohat sare yoga kar hi nahi sakte. Kyunki ek dining table leke hai. And which is very, very important that we have to change the way because obesity is the biggest risk factor for many diseases and also the complications. My, some of my colleagues who works in the area of surgery or medicine will be agreeing to that. Now, the hard fact is that soil quality in Australia is one of the poorest in the world, unfortunately, because we do not have much tectonic activity, we don't have much rivers, but we use a lot of pesticides. One of the banned substance glyphosate in a lot of many part of the Europe, you will see, still see that our councillors or council, councils have been using it and that add to the burden. And that is something which is our individual responsibility that we take it from here and ask our politicians to make those decisions because a very slow political move. Now, nowadays we have been blaming, a lot of it is related to that COVID has caused so many things. I would say that COVID was the last straw which broke the camel's back, okay, which has actually exposed many things. And there is a barrel hypothesis of disease in which stress, heavy metals, drugs, bad diet, viruses, which add on. And as a result of that, we get barrage of symptoms from an infections. Now, the aim is not to just remove the symptoms, but to empty the barrel. So this is a very, very important part when we are dealing with this, the health is that, and that's the true definition. We have to have a spiritual and mental well-being and the physical well-being as well. So what happens in a stress response? Well, if it is on the left-hand side of the bell-shaped curve, it is very good. But when we move on to the right, that's where the problems comes in. So do we need stress? Yes, we do. But as long as it is in the balanced state. Okay. Because we all know that optimal performance is maximum when we are in the balanced state. Otherwise, we are going to suffer. Now, what happens when we are in the stressful situation? You would have heard this is a hormone called as cortisol. Okay, It is a survival hormone. It is one of the things which we are given to us when we are in struggling. But when there is too much of cortisol, what happens is it starts to build up too much obesity. So there's a competition between the fat cells. And as a result of that, too many of them are packed up. And as a result, our belly increases. And that's a result where we lead to a lot of stressful responses and it leads to many, many problems. So when the cortisol rises, what happens? It leads to wide variety of problems across the spectrum of various disorders which leads to problem. And you will end up seeing as if you are going to have a different problem, but the reason is that there is only one problem, that we have got too much of stressful response in our system. Now, this is a bit complicated slide, but what I want to say is that whenever there is a rise in the levels of certain hormones, we activate our immune cells. Have you heard about a lot of people just unexpectedly dying around COVID periods? or some of them had some heart problems. Why is that? Is it that they were fit enough? 
And about a week or two ago, I heard I've never met that colleague, a doctor colleague who was who had unexpectedly passed away. So a lot of people who have been passing away, are we acting our, activating our immune system, which is now becoming skyrocketing high. Now, whenever there's a stress in life, there's always a factor which we need to look into and connectedness also helps. So I thank to all of you who have been here today to listen and I think Navneet, and my other colleagues have talked about that, how stressful balance is very, very important, and especially with our migrant community. Now, the big question is what to do. As Navneet said about swast, okay, I think how swast can be achieved with another Sanskrit word, which is we called as a sattvic lifestyle choices. So sattvic means sattvic in our thought process, sattvic in our, the way we deal with that, the way we cook, the way we interact with the society, it is not, not something to, related to one single factor, but there are multiple factors which will help us in achieving that. The first thing, whenever somebody comes to me, I always tell them that medicines are only a small proportion to your problem. I'm often saying, quoting to my patients, there's a medicine which is going to fix you is yet to be manufactured. So, how we can, can we do anything about it? Yes, we can. And the first thing is that I often emphasize, change the diet. We have also heard about some of these things that the food can be a poison, but at the same time also be a strong medicine. Now, another thing is that there's a very powerful statement which was given in 1931 by the Nobel laureate that every single person who has a cancer has a pH that is too much acidic. So cancer doesn't come out of blue moons. It, it, we cook it. We cook it with our lifestyle choices. And once we have reached that critical point, depending on your vulnerability, you will reach that stage where how it will manifest. So as we say, Australian Bureau of Statistics is not in our favor, which means that from now onwards today, you have to make it a point that have you make your five servings of veggies every day. So this is the first take home message from you, from my side, please keep that in mind and have a logbook. And when we have a balance of alkaline food, we do well. And the way we are designed by mother nature, okay, we are designed to be eating a lot of plants and fibers in our diet. Okay? Our body should be 80% alkaline and 20% acidic. So there's no harm in balancing of a food. Only thing is just keeping a close balance between both acidic so whenever we eat meat in the diet, grains in the diet, dairy in the diet, it makes our body acidic. Whenever we eat veggies in the diet, fruits in the diet and herbs and spices, that's why we call like a lot of, when we call a lot of curry masalas, they're actually concoction of several 15 to 20 different herbs and sweet, which has come up and going to balance us. So when we are sick, and that is where the acidic pH is. We have a lot of negative emotions, but when we are alkaline in our body, we have a lot of positive emotions and health. So keep that in mind that while we are dealing with a lot of our challenges and particularly with the kids which Navni talked about, their food habits also plays a very, very important role in that. that and especially that's one of my area of speciality, which is addictions. I often see that people who have been uh, go into whirlpool of addictions, have a very, very poor dietary habits, particularly they thrive on sugar containing foods, which add on to their ill health in future. And particularly if they are from the subcontinent, it's even worse. This is a slide which I share with all my patients that when we eat alkaline, we have more energy, better digestion, better fat loss, less pain and inflammation, better mental focus and better moods. So this is something which we can easily achieve. And this is, commonly talked about whenever we eat plant-based diet. You must have heard about gut-brain connection. And this is our, our second brain. Okay. Uh, there is a very famous integrated neurologist. His name is Dr. David Pearl Muter. Uh, I'm happy to share the resource list if uh, I can pass on my resource folders, books and YouTube videos, which some of them I have done it, okay, and also the books uh, which are written by elite people. And Dr. David Perlmutter in his book, Brain Maker, has talked about that 
solution to the problem of the brain lies outside the brain, and that is the second brain, which is our gut. And that's how, and he was talking about in one of the lectures, about efficacy of basic key in the diet. And he was talking about that, how some of these factors can play a very big role in our improving our health. So what are the roles of complementary medicine? We have talked about that, how we are going to balance with each other is with the help of certain practices like yoga. Now, who knows, like Deepak, Dr. Deepak Chopra now, who has completely changed the way he used to practice. I don't think he practiced medicine anymore. He's more of a spiritual guru now. And he's talked about that with the help of yoga, we enhance one of our nerve, which is called as vagus nerve, okay? So those who are from medical fraternity knows about it. Some of my surgeon colleagues visualize it every day when they are opening the body, but it is one of the ancient uh, secret which our yogis have practiced for thousands of years when we practice. Now, the other thing which, as we were, uh, Navneet showed that slide that kids were, kids were hammered by their parents, but actually it is very, very helpful. Now, do you know that most of our teachers, at least I know, my teachers asked me to pull my ears. When you pull your ears, it is very highly nerveted organ. You stimulate your vagus nerve and you stimulate your memory. So whatever our teachers did were right. They actually helped us. And that is something going to be very, very helpful. Now, what happens when we stimulate this nerve? We have a better anxiety and mood. We have a move of a gut. We have a better activity of production of stomach acid. Our heart rate improves. Our better digestion. Our liver functions better. Our uh, clean, uh, spleen and kidneys work better. And we digest the fat very much. And also, it helps in controlling our kidneys. And so as our bladder. So as our sex organs. And so as our... So you can see that... So much of the benefits are there with this. So the big question is, how do we do it? There are very simple techniques. So let's, cold shower, raise hands, how many people do it? Okay, very, very good. So from last 10 years, I've been personally doing, doesn't matter which season it is, you should take cold shower because as soon as you take the cold shower, you start improving your brown fat metabolism and you will generate relaxation. If you can't do it, okay, can you wash your face from tomorrow onwards with the cold water to begin with? Do it for about a half a minute. Okay? We talked about singing and chanting. Okay? We have talked about Navneet's talent because suddenly his vagus nerve would be stimulated if he's practicing more often. Gargling, yoga, deep breathing, laughter, there's a type of probiotics exercise and that goes on. Now, I'm part of an organization called as Heartfulness, and we have a, 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 a program for the kids. If you want to look at the YouTube called as Brighter Minds, okay? And in which there are several uh, methods have been taught to the kids how they can be balanced and at the same time proactive as well. So let's do a brief exercise of how we can stimulate your brain, both right and left. So I would like you, all of you to do it. Just watch me what I'm doing. Can you do this? One finger on this side and the other finger from that. Can you do that? Practice it. It took me some time to do it. But if you're doing it regularly, alternate finger responses, you are actually stimulating your both part of your brain. Okay. So, and as a result, when the vagus is stimulated, we have got a better intuition. Please watch this documentary. It's on Amazon Prime. Those people who are going through some tough time, what we want is to not cure their mental health. We want to heal their mental health. Okay? And what they have found is that those people who have improved from chronic diseases have few things in common. They radically change their diet. They take control of their health. They follow their intuition using herbs and supplements, releasing suppressed emotions, increased positive emotions, increasing social support. We talked about it. 
and deepening your spiritual connection. Who else can be talking about this from as compared to our own tradition, which comes from uh, thousands of years of Ayurvedic practices? Okay. Don't hesitate and shy away from them and have a strong reason to go. I like this quote and I want to all of you to think about it because all the good things starts from within. So hopefully I've made you to think over it and adopt some of these challenges or uh, suggestions in your life. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. Um, I bet this actually would be an independent talk. Probably we could go on forever. Um, and also thank you for uh, helping us to reconnect to the roots. Um, I open the question time for audience. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Doctor. It was a very good uh, speech. And uh, there's one question. How do you relate your uh, cold shower with blood pressure? High blood pressure with cold shower. I didn't get a chance to speak, but what happens is that uh, we have got two types of nervous system response. We call them as autonomic nervous system. One is sympathetic, another one is parasympathetic. Whenever you are going to have a parasympathetic nervous system response, your blood pressure is going to balance. So to answer your question, is blood pressure will be, and I'm not saying taking a cold shower, other factors have to be looked into consideration, but this is a very cheap solution, which you can take. So can it help you to regulate that? Answer is yes, it can be. And there are uh, several techniques where uh, when we are using uh, what we call as uh, pranayama techniques, okay? And especially when we are taking some pranayama using uh, uh, what we call uh, so some kind of a postures or some kind of a mudras, we actually expand our lung much, much better, okay? And that's what we happens. And like do a... Uh, I often teach my patients about breathing techniques and actually demonstrate them. Okay. Where if you are doing a breathing technique without having a mudra position and with mudra position, you will see that you have a better expansion of your lungs. Okay. And it works wonders. Okay. So only thing is don't shy away of doing it. And particularly when we breathe in from right nostril, we stimulate the brain. <clears throat> When we breathe in from left nostril, we relax our brain. So those people who are under stress, if they can have, we can have our tea breaks, coffee breaks, and sometimes why not breathing breaks? Just five minutes, two minutes, just a quiet place, close your eyes, you will see that you will reset your body very, very quickly. Hey, Dr. Sherman, thank you for excellent talk. I am myself a surgeon. I deal with a lot of the organs you showed literally like every day, every day. Um, I'm, it's an excellent talk. I'm not against any of these. I take myself pride in, I have been into various studies which looks into authenticity of cultural Indian traditions and how they are actually anatomically and physiologically related and the changes they make to it. The only thing I wanted to make as a point today is I take many of these with a pinch of salt because when it comes as a prophylactic medicine or preventative medicine, it is great. I just do not want anyone to take the message at home that if you've got an adrenal adenoma which is giving you high blood pressure, there are various different causes that can give you high blood pressure. I can almost guarantee unless I take it out, any cold shower is not going to help. So this is a preventative medicine. Please take that with the note that this is a preventative medicine. And it's just that I'm not, like I have, my wife is a yoga teacher. I do pranayama every day. I do prastika every day. Anulom vinom is something I can do and I can very well teach and I can tell you the physiological basis of it. So I'm not against any of these but alkalinity and all those things is in a preventative medicine way. It is a traditional Indian way to talk about things because I take, I have seen myself back home in India when the youngsters came with a bleach injection because they think alkalinity is great where the entire esophagus is gone. So this is a preventative aspect of the medicine. 
which is very different than the modern. And I think what we all are aiming is some sort of a conjoint venture when we can put these beliefs safely into the present day medicine and get to a, what we all have talked about, a swast life with a sattvic food. I hope I'm just trying to complement things to his talk uh, rather than anything else. Thank you. I'll have a, another question, yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah my question was regarding the, the pH. Anyway, what is your view on the ionized water? Is it a gimmick or is it worth, you know, positively ionized water, which is a new gimmick, I suppose? I don't know about it. No, it is not a gimmick. Okay. Again, uh, it can be a talk in itself. So it's very, very important that uh, we need to have a balance of minerals within the cell and outside the cell. Okay. And that's what we call as, that's how we, we call it, that a signal of a membrane potential is initiated. So whenever we are taking any kind of uh, uh, water which has got uh, rich in minerals like hydrogen, okay, it helps to nourish our cells very well and helps you to so what Anand was talking about, the extreme stage when it has led to the uh, disease. Okay. Well, at that stage, yes, these things will not work. You have to go and take extreme measures. But if you start doing these things at an early stage, very, very likely chance it can help. Okay. And it is something well known that uh, whenever we are changing the fluid in our body, so the person, the Nobel laureate who, who unfortunately now diseased, who discovered HIV before his death, he was working on water. He says that if we change the water uh, tendencies or water constituencies in our body, very likely chance we will ail a lot of ailments. And this is, uh, uh, and also our practices also makes a lot of difference, particularly some of things which I often do like vitamin D. Okay, I can, one of my favorite topics, but it is not something uh, commonly used to an extent which it should be. Okay, it's not that it's not used, but it should be used better. But uh, if you're taking ionized water, uh, check the pH of that. Okay, and if it is not on the extreme stage, yes, it's not bad. Thank you. Uh, for this uh, opportunity to Ima uh, today, uh, and I'll introduce Ashita next speaker. Uh, Ashita is uh, uh, our uh, committee member. She's been recently joined the executive committee of uh, Ima. Um, she's working as a, a doctor in King Edward Hospital uh, training, and uh, recently, actually, uh, I've not. I think she's probably the first uh, international magic medical graduate to win uh, a junior doctor of the award of Western Australia. In that words, uh, and, and uh, Ashwita started an initiative to support Indian medical graduates uh, on Chai Pe Charcha, which was quite a hit. So Ashwita, please come and share your thoughts. Thank you so much for the generous introduction, Dr. Gera. Um, I would like to thank Iswa for organizing today's event and Aima for giving me this opportunity. I'm not a psychiatrist like the rest of our panel speakers, uh, but today's topic is something uh, that I can relate to. Uh, and it is also an opportunity for me to remember one of my close friends uh, who recently graduated as a, a specialized as a psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Sanya Mbrinjavi. She was my very good friend and accidentally drowned earlier this year. Um, so she was very passionate about a community um, awareness regarding mental health issues. So this gives me an opportunity to remember her in good faith. Moving on to today's topic, it is uh, the, the one that I'm speaking on is social media and its effect on children's mental health. I will break it down into a few segments so that we can cover maximum in the 10 minute slot. I will be defining what social media is, what its effects are, primarily focusing on the negatives today uh, and how it can affect children's mental health. So what is social media? It is a collective term for websites, applications that focus on communication, 
community based input interaction content sharing and collaboration people use social media to stay in touch and interact with friends family and other communities now i will just use an analogy of today's gathering and i will basically extrapolate it to how it uh, basically reflects on social media so today iswa organized a community event we have all gathered for a common topic which was mental health and i have my content which i'm sharing with all of you here and we have certain moderators who are regulating the content and who are basically making sure we're keeping to time and things like that so if the same thing was on say tiktok youtube whatsapp facebook or instagram which are the top 5 social media platforms of the world then that would be a social media interaction so i would like you all to keep that analogy in mind for the rest of the presentation because i'll be using some examples so what is the recent trend of social media with covid-19 pandemic i think all of us can relate that children have had limited options of spending time for anything basically be it studying be it entertainment be it interacting with friends and also parents have had to work from home so for them to balance that uh basically the children's education and you know entertainment needs social media was a huge platform that they depended on in fact entirely at times so what are its effects so like we just discussed the good effects was yes it was a good platform to study for entertainment and to keep in touch with friends and family the negative effects as you all know are they can disrupt sleep cycle there is an excessive focus on appearance then there is a lot of fake or misleading images of a perfect life or a perfect body image on social media then you can't help but compare yourself with others then the other problems that come so these are the self self issues that you know you will develop or inculcate in your mind what are the external factors that can negatively impact so there's cyber bullying and trolling let's say today's talk some of you liked it some of you did not like it it's your opinion and it's good to have an opinion but when it gets to direct commenting or personal messaging it could be based on the content and it could be based on the person's characteristic or appearance or ethnicity or background then that is that is very negatively impacting to a person now in a in a place like this i am protected by the moderators by the iswa committee by the aima committee online it is not as protected <laughs> that is why i will talk further about how we can protect ourselves from such incidents but online is is a very vulnerable place especially for cyber bullying and trolling then the next thing is catfishing now i think uh, most of us would have come across this at some point if let's say when i was applying to iswa for expression of interest for this topic i sent a picture of deepika padukon saying this is me and then on the day of the talk i appear so it's basically pretending to be something or someone that you're not <clears throat> and that is very much of a risk to young population because an older person may be talking to them as a teenager or as a younger person online and there is no way to verify that on certain websites of course doxing is something that i also got to know very recently while doing research on this topic <clears throat> so if i know you personally i can basically access or if i have access to your documents which personally identify you and put them on social media with the sole purpose of harassing a person that's called doxing and this is also a form of bullying and harassment so these are certain things that can externally affect you then there's all of course fear of missing out fomo such a such a major anxiety causing issue uh, in in youngsters like when i was when i was in school harry potter was the big thing so if i was not having a hard cover of harry potter i had fomo but luckily i was not into harry potter so it helped me and as you all know we have all been through this it is very addictive like we go into that rabbit hole of looking at reels after reels and losing track of time it can be very addictive without us knowing about it and you can spend a lot of time on scrolling instead of actually engaging in social interaction and self care again like sleeping or or having a proper diet so in medicine everything is uh, has a certain structure we say there is a problem we say what are the problems effects we say what is the recommendation to avoid this problem 
So these are the recommendations that American Academy of Pediatrician has recommended. So usually what happens whenever we identify a problem in medicine, there is a group of professionals who are experts in that field who sit down, study the population, and based on that population, <coughs> give us suggestion that what is the existing trend and what is the recommendation to avoid problems in the future. So they say children under two should have no screen time and children over two should have no more than an hour or two daily. A bit extreme, isn't it? Based on their own research, they say eight to 12 year old children spend to four to six hours a day online and teenagers up to nine hours daily. That's like a regular work hour, isn't it? Like nine to five. So nine hours daily, too much screen time. What can that do? So, okay, fine, the kids are doing this. What can it lead to? So these guys said that it leads to behavioral problems, learning disability, attention deficit disorders. Why does that happen? Like, I mean, we, we all do this all the time. Like, even as adults, we do it all the time. Why does this specifically affect children? Because we need to understand that children are very much hands-on learners. We have developed our cognitive part of the brain, but children are still developing. And they need to have those stimulations to actually develop those skills um, to become <coughs> well-functioning adults. So what have they recommended? They said, okay, under 18 months, no screen time unless they're doing video conference with family members. Then they have said 18 months to 24 months, high quality programming that is decided by yourself and you sit down with them and then watch those programs. For two to five year olds, limit the screen time to one hour per day. And for children six and up, again, they need to have a high quality programming, but they need to have a schedule of when they get to access that screen time and when they stop. So these are the recommendations, but like everything else, diet, sleep, exercise, it's very hard to follow recommendations that are set by professionals who sit in a room and decide, okay, this is what you should do and this is what you should not do. So what can you do to ensure that this experience for your children is healthy as much as possible? You can follow well-being pages. So, uh, like I discussed earlier, when I'm speaking here, there are moderators to protect me, right? Or to protect you from false information, protect me from any trolling or cyberbullying, or oh, sorry, in-person bullying. Likewise, there are pages which support well-being and they're well-moderated so that they have appropriate content. Then there are pages supporting diversity. As a few of my seniors before me have spoken today and emphasized on the importance of identity development in uh, culturally diverse uh, background children, it is very important that they know that there are, uh, like because online media can be very niche if you're in a particular part of the world. So it's very important to follow pages that have diverse people representing themselves on there so that the children can relate to them and can see that there is a good future for children who have certain ethnic backgrounds. Pages and people with balanced view. Now, how I mentioned earlier that there are certain pages which kind of promote a certain kind of body image or a certain kind of lifestyle which are not attainable. So it's very important to follow pages which show the good and the bad of the life, the challenges, the difficulties of life and how these people cope with these challenges and difficulties. Then they can join safe and supportive groups. Now, there are children who sometimes have are living with disability or with some diseases or certain other disadvantages that may not be visible to us at a superficial level. It's very important that they know that there are groups available which are supporting them and support their views. Causes that, are, that, that they're passionate about. Now, let's say someone's interested in music or someone's interested in skateboarding. They can join groups with children who have similar passions or adults who have similar passions and they moderate those discussions around those passions and give them tips and tricks on how to benefit or organize meet and greets or organize competitive events relating to the interests that they have. It is also a very good bonding opportunity for parents with children to join these groups that the kids are passionate about. Then also it's very important to go to these pages which share the member's stories. Again, going back to the balanced viewpoint that I mentioned earlier. Now, what are the points that you need to remember to let your children know are important when they are on social media platforms? 
because see, you can only prevent it to a certain point, but it is inevitable that they will be exposed to this at some point in their life. So social media should not actually replace real socializing with friends. So organize play dates for them. Go to their sporting events. Show that interest that you are also interested in their passions, even if they don't align with what you have planned for them. So that's a very big supporting, um, I think, point, which will increase their trust in you. Make sure that take the tech break from time to time. So it could be dinner time, it could be bedtime. That time, there's no screens, no TV, no phones, no iPad. So make sure they have this period of the day where there is no technology involved so that they know that despite not being online, life still goes on. It is not the end of the world if they're away from that social media, uh, whichever platform they're on. Then they must remember, this is for security purpose, very important, that certain things should be kept personal, like where they live or where they go to school. Now, we have talked about what social media is, what are its effects, what is the recommendation, what is the best way that you can ensure a healthy interaction on social media. But again, we can only do our best. Sometimes things don't go as planned. So help is available. How can we seek help? The first step to seeking help is identifying that there's a problem. How can you identify that there's a problem? You would know your child better than any doctor in the first visit or the fifth visit or the 10th visit because you're living with them, you've seen them grow. Some kids are quiet, some kids are born bubbly. So it's, it's, it's a varied, it's a, it's a very fine, uh, fine, fine behavioral change that you will, you will probably pick up better than straight up probably going to a doctor if you think there is a problem. So what are the things that you can generally look out for? Would be unexplained temper tantrums, unusual fears, or avoidance of certain uh, topics or events or conversations, noticeable disinterest in the things that they usually like, and persistent sadness and helplessness. If you think that, yes, this is not normal, please contact your local GP. And it's been already mentioned that how the Australian healthcare system is heavily reliant on the GP services. So please contact your GP. Now let's say someone like me who's never had kids, I suddenly have kids and then I'm seeing all of this. I don't know if I should go to a GP. I don't know if I'm being paranoid. So I can go online, Beyond Blue, very nice website. It has all these checklists, it has self-help guides, and it, it, it is a very good starting point to, um, to basically help me assess where I am uh, in a crisis situation. And if it is a crisis situation, please call the helpline. 131114. Anywhere in Australia, 24-7, it is available. A professional is there to help you, guide you, what to do in a situation of crisis. Now, to prepare this whole presentation, I use certain references. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't use social media as my reference. These are some of my references. Uh, I'm more than happy for you if you want to click a picture. These are very generic websites. They are not at all involved with medical jargon. Uh, and again, they have very good self-help guides and they have very good checklists. And here is where I end my session. Any questions, please? Any questions from Flo? Okay. Uh, thanks, Susita. Excellent presentation, and it clearly shows how much work you are putting to your presentation. Um, I mean, uh, rather than just more of a question, a little point to add. And I think, as far as we know about the risk of social media with the teenage kids, uh, whether we like it or not, but these days they even communicate on social media. So no one is text messaging, and and that's why, especially if your child is of certain age, you can't stop them from using social media. That's number one. And that's where we face the first difficulty when at age of 10 or 12, they will say, look, I need Snap or WhatsApp. But that's how they communicate. So fear of missing out is the one, but also feeling quite alienated from that social circle or the groups. I think um, such is the world we are in where we like it or not, but I think it has forced parents to know about social media so that children know that my parents are aware what the social media is and what are the risks. One strategy would be to talk to them regularly that I know what this media is about and what are the risks and encourage them 
that if you are not sure how to respond, don't do it in rush. Come to me and talk to me, and I will help you with with having your response on the social media. Because a lot of the risk that we see, it's not that they want to do, but sometimes they just do it because everyone else is doing it. So I think articulating it and giving them an impression that my parents are well aware of social media, what they are and what are the risks, I think they will come and talk to the parents openly, then giving an impression that parents are just dumb and don't know anything about social media, then they will try to find solutions on their own way, which could be a bit more risky. And that's very true. I cannot agree more with you on that point. Um, I would like to say that's why I mentioned to explore the passions that the kids can uh, kids are basically interested in. So parents can join those websites along with the kids and also engage in the social activities that these websites host with the kids. Of course, sometimes it's very difficult to get in that world, uh, but we have to start somewhere and we can only do so much and hope for the best, I guess. Thank you. Thanks, Ashuta, for a nice talk. Can I request, oh, there's one more uh, comment or question from Namit. Thanks very much. Uh, just a very, very specific question. You mentioned there was, I, I landed a recording here. So I have the PowerPoint that you talked you about. You want me to go back? I think no, that's all right. So you said about um, follow well-being pages, and then there was pages supporting diversity. Is it possible for you to elaborate on any one or two specific examples? Like, for example, I want to search and find a page or a website which is great. Is there any example, quick example that you can reference? Um, so uh, I will take the example of uh, Facebook. Uh, and Facebook sometimes has specific Indian community websites or sporting websites, which only focus on those certain aspects. Um, like I had study groups on Facebook. When I came to Australia, I had no guidance. I had uh, I didn't know anyone here who could help me with studying. So there were specific uh, AMC guided websites. And what would happen there is if anyone comments anything else, then the moderator immediately takes it down. And I think the same is with the Indians in Perth website. They're very relevant to what that website, uh, sorry, what that page does. And similarly, there are gaming websites uh, like, um, uh, sorry, it's on my phone, but now that you've asked me, I think it's Switch, uh, which is a gaming only, it's like a vlog where if I'm gaming, anyone can see me gaming. So if let's say PUBG, don't judge me. I was preparing for my exams, I was not working yet. I was playing PUBG. So when I'm playing PUBG, it will stream on the gaming website. Now, what happens there is, Anyone in the world can view me or only my friends can view me. My setting was only my friends can view me, but this is where things get a bit tricky that when anyone can view you, then there's commenting and then there's harassment and bullying, but you can always regulate that. So if, if let's say uh, your kids are on, on that website or sorry, on that platform, then you can change the setting so that only their friends come in. So let's say during a lockdown scenario, they can all gain, and if one of them dies in the game, then they can follow the other person's game. So this is one of the things that like, I found useful for myself, because when I was new to it, I didn't know that you know cyberbullying is a thing. And when I got exposed to it, I was like, oh, no, no, no. And I had very protective friends in India and the, and the States. And it's good because you can, you can get all your friends across the globe to come on at the same time. You can organize timing slots where you do gaming and, and other things. Of course, there's so many things out there. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ashwita. Now, that's a very valid point uh, to change the settings. So anybody's children, if they are on online gaming, just see that they can, only their friends can view because there are a lot of adults out there who look at children if they're playing alone and can venture into that chat setting. 